Well, hi everyone. Um, this is new for me. I have never done a live stream like this and hopefully all the technical issues are working themselves out. So let me know if you can hear me. Um, let me know where you're coming, uh, where you're showing up from. And yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, this is this is all new for me. So anyway, I'm, I'm really excited to be doing this. Thank you all for coming. I'm happy to get to interact with you guys in a little bit more, um, like a little bit more real time. And I'm watching the comments come in. And okay, good, yes. Hey, hello from Australia, Seattle, we can hear you. Great, awesome, Pennsylvania, Canada, awesome. Uh, yes, it's kind of unbelievable to me that there's people all over who are listening to me. <laughs> um, yes, so good to be here. Just want to start with like the disclaimer as usual, like what I do on my channel is education. I try and provide resources. I try to help people um, find the skills that can help them grow and improve their lives. But what I'm doing is not a substitute for medical advice. It's not a substitute for therapy. Um, all of these questions you guys are asking are awesome and they're big questions and I'm, I'm certainly not going to be able to address them all, but also I'm not going to be able to address them for you individually. I'm going to address them on a general kind of a broad scope of like, here's some things you can consider. Here's some resources you can look at, but um, always work with your own medical provider, work with your individual therapist whenever possible. Um, because what I'm doing is not therapeutic advice. It's just an attempt to help people get more resources, get more education about these mental health topics that so many people are um, curious about. So welcome everyone, glad you're here. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to uh, do this live stream is because I think in the next week we're gonna hit a half a million subscribers. And that's really exciting for me that there's so many people out there who, like you, are wanting to improve. They're wanting to grow. You're wanting to find new skills and resources. So that just makes me like super happy that there's people in this world who are like, I wanna make my life better and make this world a better place. So thank you all for being here. And I hope that I can help you all out a little bit today. Um, yeah, so there you go. There's my introduction. Welcome, welcome to the live stream. Let's do this. Okay, so many questions and they're big questions and they're really good questions. Um, I'm gonna try and start with a couple of questions that I've seen that are um, a little bit easier. And by easy, I don't mean like, oh, that's an easy problem. I mean, um, these, these questions have a little bit simpler answers. So the first question I'm gonna respond to is one of the first on the chats. It says, how do you cope if, uh, if you're living with an alcoholic? Or how do you cope with an alcoholic? Okay, so my first response to this would be get support. Uh, get help and there's a program out there that is specifically for family members of people with alcoholics in the United States um, I think it's around the world too and it's Al-Anon. It's not AA which is Alcoholics Anonymous That's specifically for the uh, substance user But Al-Anon as far as I understand is support for family members and you'll basically get surrounded by people who also have uh, loved ones people they care about who uh, are alcoholics and you can see common patterns and understand uh, different strategies to uh, work with someone when, when someone you care about is, uh, has a problem with alcohol. So I would recommend looking up those resources. Al-Anon. I am not a substance abuse specialist. And a lot of these questions are not in my specialty. So I will be referring you all out to other sources and um, looking up answers for future videos for you all for the questions I don't have immediate answers for. Okay, yeah, ooh. Okay, here's, a, here's another question that's hard. Um, how to figure out what to do in life? How to figure out what to do in life? Okay, that's like such a big question that it's hard, um, like it's hard to address. How do you figure out what to do in life? Um, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is one of my main models of therapy, has a lot of options for this, um, which I think can be helpful. So the first thing I would recommend is doing a values exercise. Uh, I talk about values in the first part of my emotion processing course. Um, it's really about what kind of person do you want to be? When your time comes to leave this life, what kind of characteristics do you want to have embodied in your life? So you ask yourself those questions and acceptance and commitment therapy has a lot of worksheets on this. You can find them in um, the book, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. 
but you can also find a lot of free resources on Russ Harris's website. So if you Google Russ Harris, he is an acceptance and commitment therapy, um, really great educator. He's got a couple of great books out there and his website has tons of free resources. And you could try starting with a values exercise there. Um, and so the values exercise will help you clarify what's most important to you. What do you want to invest in? So how do you figure out what you want to do in life? Start by asking yourself what kind of person you want to be. And there's a bunch of exercises for this. Um, one of them is kind of like an obituary exercise, like imagining at the end of your life, when your time has come to a peaceful end, what would you want people to say about you? And that helps you identify the characteristics you want to have. Another one of these exercises is, um, Another one of these exercises is about looking at people around you that you admire and writing down the characteristics in them that you value and then um, identifying which of those are most important to you personally. So you start with values and then the, the next piece of advice that I would have is take action. Like I know it feels like, especially if you are, you know, in high school or you're in college and you're trying to choose a major, it feels like you have to choose your entire life direction right now or else. What if you get it wrong? It could be a catastrophe, right? So like check yourself for that kind of thinking because you don't, you don't have to pick right now what you're going to do for the rest of your entire life. You just need to choose what direction you're going to point in. So take the pressure off of yourself a little bit. Um, in high school, I wanted to do biology. I wanted to do art. Um, I got scholarships in both of those at different universities and I chose to go into art. And then I changed my major to um, recreation management. And then I did a double major in, well, I was a couple credits away, but I graduated with, um, uh, it, was, it was one credit away from a double major in psychology and one credit away from a major in uh, recreational therapy, and then I worked in the wilderness, and then I did a degree in marriage and family therapy. And then once you do a degree in marriage and family therapy, I mean, then I've specialized in other things. But what I'm trying to say is, you don't have to pick what you're gonna do for your entire life right now. You can just choose a direction you're gonna move in and start working towards that. And like your life, you've got a lot of time to choose what you, like if you want to change later, that's okay. So that's that's kind of my advice on this, right? Pick what's most important to you, find your values, then start moving in that direction. And if you want to change things up later, you can. So how to figure out what to do in life? Okay, there's my two minute answer. Now I think talking with people around you and working with the therapist or cou uh, like a coach or a mentor, that could all be really helpful too. So. Um, and you know, a lot of people find their, like find really interesting and beautiful paths later on in life. Um, and so it's not like you have to choose right now what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Just choose your direction for the next year or two or the next five years or the next 10 years. <clears throat> do I still make art? You know, I, um, I'm not doing it as much. I used to do, uh, like the last couple of years I did a lot of photography and, um, a lot of crafts, but with three kids and two jobs, I am not making a lot of art right now. Okay. Okay, let's see. I have gotten a lot of questions about health anxiety, agoraphobia, and social anxiety. And these um, are really kind of, I'm not going to be able to give you a really quick answer on these. These are things that you should consider as a work in progress and keep learning more and more skills. There's a lot of skills for each of these areas, but we'll start in on them. Let's start in on them. Okay. So let's start with one of the reasons I'm lumping them all together, health anxiety, agoraphobia, and social anxiety is because these are all kind of concrete phobias and the treatment for them, the big picture treatment for them is somewhat similar. So let's start with agoraphobia. <laughs> agoraphobia is uh, fear of leaving the house. Um, a lot of anxiety around um, going to new places or being in places that you're not really, you don't feel safe in. Um, even if you are safe, you feel unsafe. Um, 
health anxiety is when you're actually healthy, but you feel like you aren't or you worry that you aren't and you obsessively worry about that. And social anxiety is where you're afraid that rejection or your performance in a social situation is like really, um, it's so important that you're in danger, right? So in all those situations, you've got this kind of concrete situation where you're actually safe, but you feel like you're in danger. Now, big picture, all of these are anxiety disorders. Big picture, when you're treating anxiety, you can consider a lot of treatments. And it's important to have lots of tools in your toolbox when you're trying to treat these things. So, um, you know, you can always consider starting with your physical health, right? Um, laying this foundation for treating anxiety starts with, well, it doesn't have to start with, but one of your options is treating it in your body. So making sure your body's healthy, trying to get some exercise, um, trying to eat a little healthier, working with your doctor, make sure your levels are okay because anxiety disorders are connected to um, nutrient deficiencies um, or other health problems. So just, you know, go to your doctor, make sure you're healthy. Otherwise, take your vitamins. Um, you can consider taking um, like fish oil or a few other supplements that are specific to uh, anxiety. Now, again, I'm just going to keep up with the disclaimers, right? So supplements aren't any safer than medications. They're less regulated, but there has been some research showing their effectiveness. And I'm not here to give you advice about your medical health specifically, like work with your doctor, but there are some supplements that, that can be effective with anxiety. So I would, I would consider these things, right? Start with your physical health and some of the supplements that are helpful for, um, those types of anxiety can include uh, magnesium and inositol. Work with your doctor, right, as always. Okay, so we start with that baseline. If we're working to treat anxiety, start with that baseline of taking care of your body and trying to get your body healthy, trying to get enough sleep, trying to get enough light exposure, trying to um, have health in other areas of your life, like your social life. Okay, so then let's just talk specifically about agoraphobia. So when we have a phobia, when we're afraid of a specific thing, um, like leaving the house, or when we are afraid of, with health anxiety, we're afraid of, um, like, what if something's the matter? What if I am sick and I don't know it? What if this symptom is a sign that I have this terrible disease, right? And then with social anxiety, the fear is like, oh, what if people are judging me? What if I mess up? What if I blush? So then the thing we do that makes it worse is we try to make it go away. We try not to feel anxious. We try to force ourselves to not feel social anxiety or we obsess about that disorder. Like, oh, what, what, what is this symptom going on inside of me? And um, so like, like someone with health anxiety, they're going to obsess about this symptom. Like, oh, my stomach hurts. Does that mean I have this XYZ horrible disease? Right. With agoraphobia, people are gonna worry about like, what if I go outside and feel anxious? What if I leave my house and feel anxious? This could be horrible, this could be catastrophizing. Uh, th this could be a catastrophe. So with agoraphobia, when you avoid going outside or when you make these rules where you're trying to control the anxiety, you're trying to say, oh, I, I, I can only go outside if I don't feel anxious, then that basically tells your brain that anxiety is dangerous and the new problem is not going outside, but the new problem, your brain has determined that you, like now anxiety is the real danger. And I need to avoid anxiety by not doing things that are scary. And then that tells your brain to make yourself more anxious about that situation. And um, then you feel more anxiety about it and it creates this spiral, this cycle. So, you, so the first thing with all three of those, social anxiety, agoraphobia, health anxieties, look for how are you trying to control the anxiety or how are you trying to avoid the anxiety and that basically puts you into a power struggle with um it puts you into a power struggle with your anxiety and the way fear works anxiety is a type of fear the way fear works is the more you fight it the more power it has so to drop that struggle there are two important steps and this is big picture right big picture two important steps choose something that's more important to you than the anxiety like right now, your whole life has become about anxiety. You're not leaving your house because you don't want to feel anxious. You are obsessively checking the internet about your health because you don't want to feel worried that something's the matter with you. You avoid social situations because you're afraid you might feel anxious in a social situation, right? Your whole life has become sucked into like trying not to feel anxious. And that is making you more anxious. So choose something more important to you. What's more important 
than anxiety? Is it that you care about people? Is it that you want to connect with people? Is it that you have kids that you want to be giving your attention to instead of spending hours on the internet looking up symptoms, right? So the first step with anxiety is saying, okay, I have been focusing so much on trying to control my anxiety that I've lost track of my life. Like, I don't know what my life is about anymore. It's only about avoiding anxiety, which is making me very anxious. So values, 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 right? This is acceptance and commitment therapy, but it's like, what's more important to you? Why are you willing to feel some anxiety in order to have a meaningful and rich life? Like, are you willing to do that? And this is the fundamental, you know, the baseline of anxiety treatment is like, are you willing to feel something first? Because if you're unwilling to, if you make a rule in your head, like, oh, I can't feel anxious, then anxiety has all, all the power in your life. So you say that first, am I willing to feel this in order to live the life I value? Am I willing to feel a little anxious and go see um, my, my child who lives outside of the home? Or, or am I willing to feel a little anxious about my health and not try to resolve it by controlling it, by worrying or Googling the symptoms or getting another test. Um, so that's the first intervention is identify your values. What's more important to you? What do you want your life to be about instead of about struggling with anxiety? And then the second big step with agoraphobia and with health anxiety and with social anxiety is being willing to um, face the situation that scares you. And it's important to break it down into tiny, tiny, tiny little baby steps. And this is called an exposure hierarchy. An exposure hierarchy is, is like a ladder where you say like, here's how I'm going to face my fears on a teeny tiny little one step at a time. Um, and so with agoraphobia, uh, that might look like um, thinking about leaving the house, writing down a script where you consider leaving the house, looking at pictures of yourself leaving the house, right? Like we don't start with like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go on a 20 hour plane ride for my first trip outside of the house. No, we start with like very simple steps um, with someone who's like afraid of needles or vaccines. They might start by just looking at a picture of a syringe or looking at a picture of a vaccine or something like that. With someone who's afraid of dogs, they might start with looking at a picture of dogs or watching a movie with dogs, right? So we, like the very bottom level of this exposure hierarchy is like teeny tiny baby steps. And then um, when you do, when you face these fears, you choose an amount of time to do them. You don't say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to do this challenge until I feel anxious, then I'll quit. That actually trains your brain to feel more anxious. Your brain's like, oh, now I have an out. If I can make my human really anxious, then I can get out of this situation. No, you don't say like, oh, if I feel too anxious, I'll leave. You say, no, I'm going to that party. If you have social anxiety, you say, I'm going to that party for 10 minutes and I'm going to say, bring it on anxiety. Let me feel it. I'm going to go to the party even if I feel anxious. Or if you're on the lower levels of the, like the hierarchy, if like that's too intense, you start with something even smaller, like calling up a friend on the phone or t texting a friend, you know, just starting with something really simple. And whatever your first level is, you stay there and you repeat that exposure. You, you keep facing that fear over and over again um, until your brain learns that nothing bad happened to you when you face it. So if you're agoraphobic, if you experience fear of leaving your house, you start by imagining yourself leaving your house. You write out a script and, and you read that script of you leaving the house and you read that script a hundred times if you have to until you read that script and you're like bored of it. Or if you have social anxiety, you uh, get a friend who you know well and you call them and you talk to them for one minute. And then the next day you call them and talk to them for one minute and you do that over and over. With health anxiety, it's a little bit different, right? Health anxiety is about feeling like you're afraid. Oh my gosh, what if this means I have cancer? What if this means I have COVID? And then you Google all the symptoms and you look it up and then you go get tested. And so with health anxiety, the way you confront that is you say, oh, I'm going to notice that I'm nervous, I'm going to notice this thought. It's more of a mindful exposure to say, oh, I'm going to notice that I'm having this thought that what if I have XYZ disease and I'm going to let that thought be there without acting on it. <laughs> like, I don't need to act on this. I value spending time with my kids instead of going to the emergency room for another test. So I'm going to allow that worry thought to be there without me needing to obsess about it, search it, try and get another test. So again, this is how we treat anxiety. We do really gradual, gentle exposures and we face it and that retrains your brain that what you're afraid of is actually pretty safe, pretty safe. And um, 
we don't try to struggle with uncertainty, which is like needing everything to be safe. We have to actively accept that life does include risks. Okay, so that's like really big picture treatment on some big issues. Um, and working with a therapist, you'll be able to see like all the little minute details, like what kind of thought patterns lead to you believing that leaving the house is unacceptable? Or what kind of cycles do you get stuck in? Do you try to, like, with someone with social anxiety, they might say something like, I, I can't go outside, I can't go to a party if I blush. I have to not blush, right? And that's you getting sucked into this cycle of trying to control um, your emotions. And when we try to control our emotions, our emotions get power over us. Uh, when we accept our emotions and choose our actions and choose our values, our emotions become much less powerful and they tend to decrease. And over time, you'll probably see like a 50, 70 or 90% decrease in your anxiety if you consistently face them. But um, there's always going to be some emotions. And so like active acceptance is always going to be part of living a valuable life. So, okay. That is my, my big picture thoughts on agoraphobia, health anxiety, and social anxiety is the treatment is don't try to control your anxiety. Try to choose the life you want and learn to face your fears in a very gradual and systematic approach. And if you work with someone who does exposure therapy or you work with someone who does acceptance and commitment therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, someone who works specifically with phobias, they can help you break that down into steps. I also have some videos on this. Um, I'm trying to think of the names of them. One of them is on exposure hierarchy. One of them is on facing your fears. I've got my rewiring the anxious brain video. And each of those um, speaks kind of specifically to those, those distinct steps. And I'm, I'm also hoping to build an anxiety course over the next year. It'll probably take me a long time, but that's kind of one of my next big courses that I'm building is kind of a step-by-step, -step, like what to do with anxiety course. So there you go. One other thought about health anxiety. Health anxiety can overlap with obsessive compulsive disorder uh, with OCD. So with health anxiety, um, you want to look for those kind of obsessive patterns of seeking certainty by checking and checking and checking. And that's um, kind of a subtle form of, of avoidance. And so with OCD, and you know, I'm gonna get Kat Green on my channel. She is like my hero, but she's really great with OCD um, and with uh, working with kids and childhood disorders. But um, Kat Green is gonna have some great things to say about this. But what it comes down to is with OCD, you know, you wanna be really careful about trying to be certain and what that is is that's trying to avoid um, a feeling of uncertainty or a feeling of anxiety so it's like a subtle form of avoidance so the opposite of that is accepting uncertainty like yes I don't know if I will be 100% safe if I go to a social situation I do not know if I will be 100% safe if I go driving I do not know 100 100% of the way if I don't have you know toe cancer but I'm going to choose to live life without putting all my energy into finding out because putting all my energy into finding out is kind of like dying. So that's, that's, that, that pursuit of certainty can be connected with OCD. And again, inositol, work with your doctor. I'm not prescribing anything, but inositol is one of the supplements that um, is well connected with like tick disorder, OCD, and, um, like trichotillomania and some of those other, like those all, th those disorders all kind of overlap a little bit and they can be connected with that nutrient deficiency for some people. And SSRIs can be effective in treating them as well. So I, I mean, you know, work with a therapist who's, um, who specializes in what you want help with if you can. And I understand many of you can't afford a therapist, but that is my thoughts on that. Whew, that was a long one. Okay, let's see. Let's look at some of these other questions. Woo. Video on parental alienation. I don't know very much about that one. Um, I have attended a conference on that, um, but it's not something I'm super familiar about. How do you change learned helplessness? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, learned helplessness. There's some books on that. Um, I mean, the positive psychology field is all about the opposite of learned helplessness. You know, it's like learned hopefulness. Like you can learn to be hopeful. And some of the practices are simple things like daily gratitude practice, um, locus of control activities. And I've got videos on both of those. Um, learned helplessness. I also love the book, The Anatomy of Peace, which, um, and Leadership and Self-Deception. They're both Arbinger Institute creations, which is kind of like my favorite philosophical approach. Um, but uh, they all they all teach you to like, I, I mean, the serenity prayer from AA. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? That's, that's the locus of control activity. Take a piece of paper, draw three sections on it, and write down, this is not in my control, write it down. This is in my influence, write it down. This is in my... Um, you know, area of control. This is the things I, these are the things I can change. And then focus on those things. But learned helplessness also, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit all over the place because I just saw that question and I like it. It's a good question. Is, um, the anatomy of peace can teach you how believing you're helpless is self-justifying. It excuses you from action. And so that book freed me a little bit from my own learned helplessness, my belief that I was broken or my belief that I was un, you know, incapable of solving my problems or facing my problems. I, I can't solve all my problems, but I can at least face them and I can try a little bit. So um, th those are some resources I would recommend. Um, I'm trying to pull up in my brain the name of the book um, by the positive psychology guy. Um, Seligman, that is the guy, Martin Seligman. Let me see if I can find the book really fast. Amazon. Learned Optimism, there you go. That's the name of the book by Martin Seligman. How to change your mind and your life. And he, he's very research backed, uh, but I would definitely recommend that book um, because yeah, I've got like five minutes and he could talk about this for like five hours, so. Okay. <laughs> what if you do have toe cancer and have a bunch of anxiety about it? That's a good question. Oh, CPS, CPTSD, a holistic approach. Okay. Um, I just finished interviewing Anna Runkel from Crappy Childhood Fairy. I would recommend her channel. Go check out her channel. Okay. Crappy Childhood Fairy. She's got lots of videos on CPTSD. Ooh. Brian just asked, he has, let's see, I have four kids under the age of eight, three girls and a boy. What's your best tips for raising young kids? Oh my gosh. Um, I have three kids, six, a four and a two year old. And um, all I know is that parenting is hard and I don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, I can tell you some authors who I love if you're interested in reading. Um, I love, um, Whole Brain Child. What is the author? I am blanking on the author of A Whole Brain Child. Back to Amazon. Um, Dan Siegel, Dr. Siegel. He has a bunch of great books. Um, the Yes Brain, The Whole Brain Child, No Drama Discipline. Um, there's a great book called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen um, by Adele Faber and um, Elaine Maslish. That book teaches you how to really use empathic listening with young kids. And I think that's really important. Um, the next book is um, about rituals. Um, let me see if I can remember her name. I'm gonna pull up my kit. Did you guys know on kit.co, I have um, a list of book recommendations and I know it's not very nice of me to just be like, go read this book. It's hard for me because I, um, oh man, let's see. It's hard for me to just give a, a short answer um, because there's so much good information out there. Okay. Let's see. 
my brain kind of fell out. Easy to Love, Difficult to Discipline is another great book. It's by Becky Bailey. And her main idea is that as parents, we need to work on our own self-discipline. Um, and we need to be consistent. Um, I really believe in the power of rituals. So having a consistent bedtime routine where you interact with your children, you touch your children, you hug your children, you read to your children. I think that's really powerful. And um, Becky Bailey in this book, Easy to Love, Difficult to Discipline, she talks about um, really how to be very consistent, how to speak your child's language, how to empathize with your child, and um, how to make a lot of consistent um, interactions with them that work well. And she tells it, she tells a bunch of great stories in there. Um, so I would recommend that book. Best tips for raising young kids. You know, the best thing that happened for me with raising kids was being able to work three hours a day. When I was with my kids uh, 24 hours a day, I got really cranky as a mom <laughs> and kind of depressed. It's discouraging for me. Uh, to just be doing one thing all the time. So for me, taking care of myself, um, finding any time for yourself is so hard with kids. So um, taking care of yourself is important. Um, and for me, that involves some time away from the kids and some exercise. But those are those are some of the books I, I really like when it comes to parenting. Um, let me think. There was one other book I wanted to mention. Okay, uh, Five Love Languages, that's a, another good book. Learning How to Speak Your Child's Love Language. Oh, um, the other book I was going to mention, if you have young kids, is The Happiest Toddler on the Block. It teaches you how to speak like a caveman to your child. So I, as a, psych, you know, as a therapist, mental health provider, I'm like, wanted to talk to my kids about, um, like, oh, you must be feeling really sad that I said you can't play with that toy right now. So that must make you feel really terrible. And, and let's talk about that. And your two-year-old like functions like a caveman more, like in their brain. That's what the, the thesis of this book is. And instead of, um, you know, having these long, you know, deep, like, let me empathize with you in these big wordy sentences, you just talk to your two-year-old and you say like, oh, Gracie mad. Gracie mad. Gracie want book right? Gracie want toy. And you like learning to speak your child's language, I think is really, really valuable. And um, understanding their developmental stages. That's another thing I didn't understand as a parent was developmental stages. Um, so I worked with teenagers for years and years in treatment. And with teenagers, you tell them a consequence and then you give them the choice whether or not they're going to do the behavior. Like you're like, okay, like if you are rude to me, then, uh, you know, that'll impact our relationship later. Like, I wouldn't want you to do that. You kind of invite, you pull, and you drop. You don't be like, you can't talk to me that way, kid, because a teenager will be like, oh, really? Because I, I just did, you know? Whereas, so, so developmentally, that's how you treat a teenager. And um, I didn't know how to treat a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old. And I have been learning from one of my dear friends, Dory Haas, who has a YouTube channel called Just Keep Parenting. I've been learning how to speak my child's language and be a little bit more developmentally informed in working with them. And I've, I've learned as much as I don't like behaviorism when working with teenagers, um, behaviorism, which means like clear consequences and clear expectations is actually very helpful for young kids. And I didn't know how to do that with my oldest child and I probably messed up a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. So speaking of that self-compassion, that's pretty important. So, okay. Ooh, here's an interesting question. How can a person learn to detach himself, especially from a fantasy bond or toxic person, despite pining over a year? Ooh, that's a really interesting question. How can you learn to detach yourself? I'm thinking about this because I've had some unhealthy relationships where I was really dependent on someone. And I was hoping that they would fill this hole inside of me, um, this fear that I wasn't lovable or this fear that I wasn't good enough. And as long as I expected that that person would solve my problems for me, I needed them. So I guess my question would be, what hole inside of you is this fantasy um, filling? Is it a distraction? Is it helping you avoid some miserable reality that you're experiencing? 
Is it, um, and if that's the case, then create meaning in your life, right? Like find something else that's more meaningful than a fantasy. What do you want your life to be about, right? I'm always going back to values. Um, but what might the other hole be? Like your fear that you're unlovable? Okay. How can you, how can you create an internal sense of control over your lovableness? Like, does that mean practicing self-compassion? Does that mean letting go of lies about yourself? Does that mean being more honest with yourself? Does that mean changing something in your life so that you, like, if you're doing something that you, you don't like about yourself, like you feel like you lack integrity, does that mean you need to change something in your life and that's why you're not loving yourself? So basically what I'm asking is what's the whole, what's the core issue? What's the core belief that this fantasy relationship is trying to fill? And when you figure out that core issue, then you can figure out the behaviors after it. Now, it might be easier to just leave first to avoid that situation completely and then find out what the hole is. But if you keep going back and you keep going back, I would say explore what's the underlying cause. Yeah. Okay. I think I missed one up here somewhere. Well, I missed a lot. I know there's so many questions. Um... Thank you everyone for your kind comments. I really appreciate it. What do you think, here's a, here's a question. What do you think about somatic therapy, working on your body sensations to deal with trauma and anxiety, depression, instead of exposure, talk, or cognitive therapy? I am a huge fan of somatic therapy. I am a huge, I really like it. It really works well. Um, like the evidence is behind it. And I personally find it more helpful for me and anxiety than a lot of cognitive work. Um, so if you want to find someone who practices somatic based work, you could look for someone who is licensed or certified as a somatic experiencing professional. You could find someone who does EMDR or someone who does polyvagal theory. So really this is where trauma treatment is moving is toward, you know, a bottom up, a body based approach to healing trauma. So I'm a huge fan of somatic work. I've got about eight of my videos in my emotion processing course really are about what's going on in your body, how to calm the nervous system, how to release those emotions that get trapped in your body. Best therapy for CPTSD from all forms of abuse. Again, Crappy Childhood Fairy has some great advice. Um, I do like the somatic forms of therapy that I just mentioned. Yep, EMDR, um, somatic experiencing, polyvagal theory. Okay. Let's see if I can find, there was a question up here that I missed and I'm just gonna try and look for. Hmm. Well guys, I apologize. I know I'm missing a lot of questions and I really don't know how to do this whole live stream thing. So thanks for being here with me while we figure it out. Oh my gosh, here's a good one that applies to me. Someone asked, hello Emma, can you give some tricks to help with an overactive brain that causes insomnia? Not necessarily negative thoughts. Okay, um, this, is <laughs> this is something I, I struggle with sometimes, especially when I have like low levels of stress or high, especially when I have high levels of stress. Um, so the most standard form of advice would be learning to practice mindfulness. Um, learning to watch your thoughts and detach from them. And I've done that for a long time. And I used to really try to make myself, you know, detach from my thoughts, but that would often leave me awake for an hour or two. Um, so now I'm trying some different strategies to, um, I think exercise and overall big picture stress reduction does help with this. Like again, like decreasing your overall general anxiety can be helpful. Um, mindfulness is helpful. I don't, I don't want to dismiss mindfulness as a good option, but mindfulness is really hard for me. It's hard for me to practice mindfulness. I try and it's hard. Um, so it doesn't work for everyone. So one of the other things I do is I switch my thoughts over to gratitude um, in the middle of the night if I'm having a hard time sleeping. I'll switch over it and just start making a list in my brain of everything I'm grateful for. That tends to be quite soothing and you know kind of trigger that parasympathetic response, that anti-stress response in your nervous system. Um, I think melatonin... Like for me, I, I used melatonin just like, I've probably used melatonin 10 or 15 times 
this whole year, but it kind of helps me reset my body clock. Um, so again, I'm not a doctor, work with your doctor, but melatonin can be uh, somewhat effective at helping kind of just soothe and restore that sleep. And then the last thing I'd say, this is the thing I am currently trying and we'll see if it like in the long run is not helpful, but I've found that listening to something rather boring while trying to get back to sleep is really helpful. So I listen to these like archeology span lectures. I actually really like archeology, span but the lectures are pretty boring. Um, and I'll just listen to that. And it's just interesting enough that it kind of takes, like takes the edge off of my brain and I'll just fall asleep listening to that. And okay, so this is bad sleep hygiene, right? Like you shouldn't have a device near you, but it's been working really well for me. Like I've been sleeping a lot better. So I can recommend some channels. Um, Oh, Crow Canyon Archaeology Center, um, Baumgartner Restoration. This is a guy who just cleans paintings and fixes up paintings. These are things like Time Team. Um, these are things that like are really soothing for me, and I just listen to them in the background, and that kind of helps my brain stop thinking so much. It's probably not the best advice, but that's what I'm doing. Okay, let's see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ASMR videos. I listen to the Bible, says Christiane. So do I, actually. I like the Bible. I read the Bible. And when I can't sleep, I'll listen to it, too. And um, it'll keep my attention for a minute, and then I'll fall back asleep. Yeah. What do you think of personal development school? I don't know what that is. Childhood trauma references. Yeah, a crappy childhood fairy. Do you have any advice for someone who's dealing with retroactive jealousy? Oh man, I wish I had good advice for this. I, I really don't. And I feel like I would need to sit down in a room with someone and talk about like, what is this about? What What is retroactive jealousy about? Um, what's going on for you. And so I guess big picture, I would say emotion processing can be helpful, right? Notice it, name it, explore it, write it down, talk about it, like diagram it, process it in as many ways as possible. Because when we're feeling intense emotions, it's our brain trying to resolve something. Like we don't have emotions just because our body's out to get us. Like emotions serve a function. So what is this jealousy trying to do for you? And what would you rather be doing instead? Um, I'm not saying jealousy is a good thing. I'm saying, is, is jealousy replacing your sense of responsibility, right? Like, oh, you know, it's so unfair that such and such got that, like poor me. And that jealousy is all about making you a victim or is the jealousy more about fostering anger and anger is a secondary emotion to cover up what's really going on underneath. So, I mean, my recommendation with strong, intense emotions like that is to practice emotion processing. And you know, that entire course is um, going up on YouTube. We've got 25 sections of it on YouTube and there's gonna be another five sections before the end of the year. So you could start like specifically using that course with your jealousy issue. Jocelyn asks, can you permanently find a way to train your parasympathetic nervous system to calm down? Um, I think the research on your nervous system is it's kind of like riding a bike. Once you learn to trigger that parasympathetic response, it's kind of like having learned to ride a bicycle. But then the more you practice it, uh, the more you practice um, calming your nervous system, that's like the muscles. So... Uh, your vagal tone, that is the strength of your vagus nerve, which is key in calming your nervous system. Your vagal tone um, essentially is like the muscle tone. The more you practice it, the stronger you'll get. So I take your question as being like, hey, can you train your legs to permanently be able to ride 50 miles on a bicycle? And I would say um, there's nothing you can do that is like a one-time fix. But if you constantly exercise, you'll constantly be able to um, engage that system and engage that, 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 your vagal tone. It's your, it's basically the muscles of your parasympathetic response. 
So the more you practice, the more mus muscles you have. So is there a one-time fix? No. Is there a way to learn to do it? Yes. And then if you keep practicing in that, you will strengthen your vagal tone. Oh my. Okay, constant vaccination, pros and cons. Don't know who to believe. Got two kids on opposite sides of the spectrum. Anxiety and tears have taken over daily, all day help. Okay, I am going to answer this question. I have not wanted to make a video on this because I understand this is a very heated topic with a lot of people, with a lot of opinions. Um, and it's such an emotional issue in the news that it is hard to know what to believe. Um, so first, let me say, I respect everyone's individual right to self-determination. I believe each person should choose what to do with their own body and no one else should take that choice from them. Um, I think people also should be informed and I think people should do their very best to inform themselves about their choices. <clears throat> when it comes to the vaccines, if you, I, I understand there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people choose not to vaccinate. I personally have chosen to get the vaccine. And the reason why is when you look at the science and you look at the numbers behind it, vaccines are statistically safer than um, not getting vaccinated. <laughs> so while some people are injured by vaccines, some people are injured by vaccines. Vaccines have side effects. All medications have side effects. Food has side effects. Like going for a walk down the road has a side effect and sitting on your couch has a side effect. Like all your choices, like life involves risk. Going rock climbing has risks and not adventuring also has risks. Like you might risk regretting not doing something cool with your life, right? So both choices have risk. And I wish people were a little bit more open about this, that choosing to get vaccinated, like um, a small, small percentage of people do have a negative side effect from a vaccine. And um, a much larger percentage of people do have a negative side effect from getting COVID. Now I respect people's choices, I really do. And so if, if you want to inform yourself statistically, based on simply the numbers, vaccines are safer. And individually, you have to make your own choice which risk you want to accept. And I know people, and I love people, I have good friends who have chosen both directions. Um, I look at my friends who are currently unvaccinated and I see people in my community who are in their 40s and who are dying and leaving children behind because of COVID. And I, really want the people who are unvaccinated to like choose vaccines but i respect everyone's choices so you have you have everyone has a choice and the right to their own body so there's my stance on vaccines <laughs> oh we'll see how um how that one goes i'm not gonna read the comments on that just kidding <laughs> maybe i will when i get to it okay I, I do appreciate everyone who's chipping in, um, contributing uh, some money to this. I didn't even know that was an option. That shows how much I understand um, how these chats work. I didn't know that people could pay to ask questions. So there you go. That's how much I know. I mean, on this chat, I didn't know that those settings were there. Hi, Michael Aldo. I am not your online therapist, but I do care about you and I will be your online educator. <laughs> How can we make decisions that are not emotional? Man, we are primarily emotional beings. We are not primarily thinking beings. We are primarily emotion beings that emotional beings that think, not thinking beings that have emotions. And um, so how do we use, I, the question says, how can we make decisions that are not emotional? And I would say, ooh, how do we make decisions where we are the decider and our emotions and our thoughts are um, informative? So I would say practice uh, learning cognitive diffusion and mindfulness and meditation can help you learn to separate yourself from your thoughts and emotions so that you can look at them from an observer point of view instead of being reactive to them, needing to act on them or act to make them go away. So I would, I would encourage you to practice mindfulness. There's a lot of good resources out there. Um, the book Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life by Stephen Hayes has like four chapters on it and that's the acceptance and commitment therapy perspective on that. So. Um, there's also some easy apps that are really easy to learn how to do this, like apps like Calm and Headspace, um, Mindfulness 101. Yeah. 
Um, and, and the main principles of mindfulness are stop judging your emotions, stop reacting to your emotions, get good at noticing them, be in the present moment, notice your physical sensations, and notice your thoughts as if you are watching them. And there's exercises you can practice. I've got an exercise called Leaves on a Stream. That is um, one way to learn how to do that. And um, what else? That's the main idea of mindfulness, but you just got to practice it. And I've got some videos out there on that. <clears throat> Chad Kirk asks, what are practical steps to getting rid of paranoia? I had a bad childhood and I'm always thinking people are watching my every move and I have to anticipate their reaction to what I'm doing. So um, in, in most therapy settings, this would probably not be called paranoia. This would be called hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things I would say is, yeah, this is... This is probably interfering with your life. It's making it hard to function the way you want to function. Um, and like a little bit of compassion and understanding of what's the function of this might help you make a little bit more peace with it. So um, because you had a rough childhood, uh, hypervigilance probably kept you safe. Like being constantly aware of what's going on in your family or in your dangerous environment helped you know when to leave, when to hide, when to shut up, when to you know, get, maybe you had to fight or something like that, right? So your hypervigilance in the past served a function for you. So give it a little bit of love and honor and then acknowledge that's just one part of you. Um, with hypervigilance, I, I do think there's a lot of safety and grounding exercises that can be helpful. Um, PTSD work in general, like trauma work in general is going to be helpful. So if you can, you know, see a therapist who does EMDR or somatic experiencing therapy or someone who's a trauma specialty, uh, a therapist who specializes in trauma. But when it comes to hypervigilance, I think there's kind of two steps and there's the cognitive part, which is like noticing like, oh, I feel in danger when I'm actually safe. And so reinforcing in your mind, I am safe right now. And every time you are safe, like noticing that, like, oh, this person is not attacking me, even though it feels like they might be. And that, that, that's a cognitive work. So you look for um, cognitive distortions and all or, all or nothing thinking, and you look for times where you exaggerate a situation, like you, you feel worse than you were. Um, and then also with cognitive therapy, you'd look at, you know, identifying triggers, like writing down, what are the situations that trigger me? What are the people that trigger me? What are the words that trigger me? And um, finding out, you know, what's this about? You know, like, like, like exploring those triggers, exploring your reaction, and then exploring a different way to think about that situation. Like, oh, you know, oh, when my wife criticized me for this, I thought she was attacking me, but really she was trying to. So, so there's the hypervigilance, right? You're, you're paranoia. You might think someone's out to get you, and you might respond by lashing out. And if you were to change how you think about that problem, you might think, oh, my wife is... Um, my wife's trying to help us solve problems together. She's on my team. She loves me. It's okay. I'm safe. I'm safe in this relationship. And so you kind of soothe yourself. And that's the cognitive side of this. And, and you reframe it to say like, oh, this is my wife trying to help us have a better home or whatever. And that can help soothe the cognitive side of that hypervigilance. And then the other side of that hypervigilance is really what's going on in your nervous system, that fight, flight, freeze response in your nervous system. And I think this takes priority over the cognitive work, in my opinion. Um, I, recognize, I, I recommend the book by Peter Levine, um, Healing Trauma. I think I always say his last name wrong. I think it's Levine, but I'm not sure. Um, healing Trauma, and he talks all about the, you know, how trauma gets trapped in your nervous system. I do have a, a video kind of reviewing his book, but his book is like 60 pages. It's something you could read in, you know, an hour or two if you can. So. Mm. How do you tell the difference between anxiety and intuition? That's an awesome question. <clears throat> I just heard an author speak about that on Nick Wignall's podcast, and I listened to it. And I learned a lot from it. So I would definitely recommend this podcast episode by Nick Wignall. Um, I'm going to see if I can find it really quick to reference. His podcast is called Minds and Mics. Mind as in your brain. 
well, a mind is not your brain, but yeah. Minds and mics. And the, um, Yeah, this is it. It's episode 28, um, Sensitive Strivers and Imposter Syndrome with Melody Wilding. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that if I put it right there. Um, but this is the podcast episode. No, you, that's really too shiny, huh? Um, yep, that's really not helpful. I'll put the link in the description. Um, the difference between anxiety and intuition, in my mind. Um, intuition is a sense of knowing, hmm, it's tricky to tell the difference. And I feel like the more you practice, the more you can tell the difference. Intuition is more about, um, it's a little bit quieter. Intuition is a little bit more subtle, whereas anxiety is frequently loud. Um, anxiety is frequently fear-based, and intuition is often more action-based. Um, anxiety is often a little bit more distorted. It's a little bit more exaggerated. And it's almost like you compare it to like, like I feel like anxiety is closer to like what a news, uh, a news report sounds like. Like newscasters are always like telling the most extreme version. And um, between like a really good solid like like a book on it like a like a book on a topic versus the news story about a topic like the book is more like hey here is what's happening and here's what you could do about it and anxiety is like fear <laughs> um, but I do I do recommend that episode I wish I could remember more of it Melody is a, a kind of an expert on that she specializes on that and especially with sensitive people we're a lot more likely to feel a little bit of both a little bit more intuition and a little bit um, more anxiety. I wish I did a better job explaining that. Go check out Nick's podcast on that. Okay, let's see if I can find a, like two more questions to answer before I'm out of time. And I really do apologize that I can't answer everyone's questions. I'm really grateful you're all here. Um, <clears throat> Ooh, how can I improve the Vegas tone? Um, yes, 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 yes. I've got three videos coming out this month on biofeedback and your vagal tone. Um, so that I've got a video on biofeedback, on heart rate variability, and on chronic pain. Um, and someone asked a question about fibromyalgia. And this biofeedback system can be helpful with fibromyalgia. Uh, I'm sorry, that question was like 45 minutes ago. But um, using biofeedback can be helpful with fibromyalgia because you are regulating your nervous system. And chronic conditions like that are real. They are physical, but they are very closely connected to your nervous system. So learning to regulate your nervous system can be really helpful. Um, learning to improve your vagal tone. I have two videos on this. Um, four ways to soothe anxiety in the nervous system and four more ways to soothe anxiety in the nervous system. So you can check those videos out. When I'm talking about the nervous system, I am talking about your parasympathetic response and your vagal tone. Who's in the wedding picture? That's me and my husband right up there. I asked Ryan if he wanted to be in on this live stream and he's like, no, but I think he's listening. So if he wants to pop in right at the end, he can. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see. Can you make a YouTube video on OCD? Yes, I'm going to be working with Kat Green on this because OCD, if you have OCD, you should not just see any old therapist. I really do not recommend that because an, a general anxiety therapist might teach you about, um, a general anxiety therapist might teach you about coping and minimizing and decreasing your uh, um, anxiety and avoiding triggers and soothing yourself. And an OCD therapist knows that doing those things actually can make OCD quite a bit stronger. And the best way to manage OCD is exposure response prevention, learning to face your fears and realizing that they are, you know, the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. You know, they're just like the man behind the curtain, like they don't have as much power as they seem to have. And so with OCD, you really should be working with a therapist who does exposure response prevention. There's also um, a resource out there. These guys are not sponsors, but I do like their work. Um, it's an app called NoCD, N-O-C-D, and they are kind of like BetterHelp, which is a sponsor, but they're not specifically sponsoring this video. Um, but NoCD gets licensed therapists that you can talk 
with on your phone. I mean, you like schedule with them and everything. And they have a little program there that helps you work through OCD. So that's a resource I recommend. Um, there's also a lot of books on OCD that are good for younger kids. Um, let's see. What to do. What's the one on OCD? What's the book on OCD? Just give me one second. Um, let's go back to therapy in a nutshell. Um, I've got like a kit on helping children with anxiety. Let's go take a look at this. On kit.co, I just make lists of books and stuff so people know, because I'm always recommending books, right? Um, what to do when your brain gets stuck. This is a book for children about OCD, but it's really good for adults too, because it's so simple, it's easy to read, it's like very thin. You know, like I don't like recommending 500 page books. So, what to do when your brain gets stuck. A Kid's Guide to Overcoming OCD by Don Hubner. That's a good book. Um, let's see. <laughs> Talking back to OCD, and then of course, um, Brain Lock. That's another good book. So, where's my live stream? Thanks everyone who's chipping in here. I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's okay that you brought up the vaccine. Whoever's apologizing, we can talk about hard things. It's okay if people get upset. We can handle it. Let's see. How do you know if something is an intrusive thought? Also, can intrusive thoughts cause feelings, sensations, or desires? Yeah, they can. Sure. Yeah. The thing about intrusive thoughts and I'm going to be doing another video on Kat, with Kat Green on this. She's like my favorite specialist on OCD. And intrusive thoughts are really connected with that. Um, I think intrusive thoughts is kind of a strong term. But everyone has some thoughts that are unwanted or they pop in and they're, they don't necessarily, like the person experiencing them doesn't necessarily like them or want them. This is normal human experience. Um, with some people with different brains or with more OCD tendencies, these thoughts might be very disturbing uh, or very upsetting or really, really bothersome. And, you know, for a lot of people, like one specific subset of OCD is like intrusive sexual thoughts, right? Or in intrusive, like consistent obsession about sexuality. And so, yeah, that can cause sensations or desire. And I would just say that the, the mere fact that you have a thought does not say anything about you. Like, like I had the most kind, sweet, gentle, loving clients who had really horrific thoughts about doing horrible things. Just because you have the thought doesn't mean anything about you. It doesn't mean you're going to act on it. It doesn't mean you have to act on it to make it go away. And so learning the skills of what to do with intrusive thoughts, I think is really important, especially for people with really loud intrusive thoughts. Some people have quieter ones, but just because you have a thought you don't like. I mean, I guess that's my definition of intrusive thoughts, a thought you don't like, and it comes in maybe more than you would like to have it. And um, what do you do about it? Well, we're making a course. Me and Kat are making a course right now. It's already been filmed. It's going to be live uh, hopefully in the next week or two. And it's not going to be very much money. I think we're hoping to list it at $39. And it's going to walk you through the steps of what to do with intrusive thoughts. And Kat Green is just, she like... I do. I recommend finding a therapist who's dialed in on your topic. Like I really focus on anxiety disorders. I focus on working with teenagers. I focus on trauma. And those are kind of my main areas that I've read and studied and attended seminars and worked on and developed and improved. And um, so if you're working with intrusive thoughts, find a therapist who does OCD, right? But I, I mean, I'm going to work with her too. Okay. Any help for severe social anxiety, please? Wow, I'm going to keep making videos. I'm going to keep making videos for all of you wonderful people. Um, I wish I had time to do a therapy session with all of you. I wish I had time to do <clears throat> a year of therapy with all of you. I love doing therapy. There's a great book called Painfully Shy. It's my favorite book on social anxiety. I can't remember the author's name. Let me look. Pardon me. Barbara Markway and her husband, Gregory Markway. 
It's a great book. It's basically a step-by-step -step program. So if you have the ability to read um, that book, Painfully Shy, I would recommend that. Otherwise, I'm going to keep making videos. I'm going to make videos about a lot of these topics you guys are bringing up. Intrusive thoughts, social anxiety, um, agoraphobia, health anxiety, driving anxiety. Yeah. Intrusive thoughts is not OCD. Um, intrusive thoughts is one thing that overlaps with OCD. Just to clarify, someone asked that. OCD is different than intrusive thoughts, but can include them. I don't know why I'm coughing. <coughs> 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 The cough must mean it's about time to wrap things up. Also, it's bedtime. I got to get my babies to bed. Um, thank you all for joining. I wish I could have addressed all your questions. Thank you all for contributing, for being here, for listening. Ooh, will I make videos on ADHD? I hope so. I hope so. That's a great topic. How to stop apologizing for everything. Yes. Yes, so many good topics. Um, I'm going to put them on my list and I'm going to work on them and make videos as quickly as I can. So thank you all for being here. Really appreciate you. I hope you all have a good evening or morning wherever you are. And um, yeah, hope to see you around on the channel. Take care.